All right, let's get started. And that's killing me. Uh, Socrates. Sorry, I was looking at the slides. We, we already did Socrates for the most part, right? But we didn't cover the apology yet. No, I think we just got to it. So we were just covering Socrates, so maybe do a quick recap of what we know from Socrates. What do you remember about Socrates so far? He was a guy that walked around Athens. He was part of like the, the Peloponnesian Wars. He fought the Peloponnesian Wars. Wars. Yep. Uh, he was against the uh, Sophists. Yeah, he was against the Sophists, and particularly he was against their skepticism. Yeah. So he was very anti-skepticism, anti-skeptic, anti-skeptic, something to that effect. He believes in universe. He believes in objective and absolute truth, beauty, and goodness. So, completely opposed to the notion that reality is in the eye of the beholder or anything to that effect. Anything else? Yeah, he introduced uh, the importance of definitions. So he brings a focus for the first time on definitions, and he points out, look. The reason that a lot of you skeptics are saying that you can't know about justice is you, you're not even talking about the same thing. You don't even have a definition of what you're talking about. So you're sitting here talking past each other. In fact, you're oftentimes probably talking past yourself, not realizing that you don't even have a consistent notion of the concept you're talking about. So we go to the sophist who would spend a lot of time talking about justice, and he'd ask him for a definition of justice. And anytime they offered up a definition, he'd show them how there was a contradiction in their thinking, and they didn't actually believe that definition. And you keep pointing this out over and over again to people. You do it with generals talking about courage, for example, showing that they didn't really know what courage was. And so he thought that uh, one of the major reasons that uh, Athens was falling into the skepticism was this lack of clarity when it came to the notions that they were talking about. And maybe if we could get our definitions down, have universal definitions, definitions that encompass universals, then we can start talking about universal truths and other things to that fact. Anything else? I think that kind of captures where we were at. I think so. Okay, so uh, the, the, I don't know what slide it is, it doesn't matter. Uh, the four major dialogues that Plato has that pretty much encompass Socrates' life are the Euthyphro, the Apology, Crito, and Phaedo. Euthyphro is when Socrates is going to the court to set his court date. The Apology is his actual trial. We remember that Apology in that context doesn't mean an admission of guilt. It's not saying I'm sorry. An Apology is your defense, your explanation. So that's why it's called the Apology. At the court trial, it's him giving his defense for his actions. Then you have the Crito, the Apology he's sentenced to death, and he has to stay in prison until his execution date. The Crito is when his rich friends show up to break him out of prison, and he refuses to go. And then the Phaedo, when he ultimately drinks the hemlock and dies. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, of those, we're going to cover the Apology, not Crito, because Mason's not here now, right? He still don't want to cover it? Uh, we can talk briefly about it if we want, but... Okay. So you're the Apology, and then you're Phaedo. No, all the way around. Other way around. So we'll start with you doing the apology, you doing Phaedo, and then I'll talk about the apology after that. That's probably the way we'll do. Sound good? Uh, you don't want me. You don't want to talk about it, and then let me do Phaedo. No, we'll let you guys go through just to make sure that we get done today. Because who knows if we end up going all weird tangent with this? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Bill. The Apology of Socrates by Plato gives us the trial of Socrates. He was brought to court for the first time in his life in Athens, around 70 years old. He was confronted with many accusations, both by ancient and recent accusers, and he gives his defense regarding the many lies told about him. For the most part, he speaks as he usually does, in a direct and derogative manner. Despite being called the Apology, this isn't Socrates apologizing for what he did as we know the word. It's rather the opposite. While he gives his defense for his action, he declares many times that he does not feel remorse for what he did, and he would never change his ways, even if those were the terms for which he gets released. He is attacked for many things, 
bolstering old and new accusations. And he begins first by defending the older and proceeding to the more recent of the accusations. He first regards the older. These are the rumors that have been circulated around him since many of the Athenians who were in court were children. He couldn't directly fight those accusations since he doesn't know the identity of his attackers. He quotes, all these, I say, are most difficult to deal with, for I cannot have them up here and examine them, and therefore I must simply fight with shadows in my own defense. He begins by summing up the older accusations that have been brought against him. He claims they say, Socrates does nothing that is just. He is a curious person who searches into things under the earth and in the sky, and he makes the worse appear the better cause, and he teaches the aforesaid doctrines to others. These were the nature of the accusations brought on him by the old accusers and he proceeds to give the Athenians the truth behind these statements. He begins by telling a story of why the accusers have brought such unfounded and ridiculous lies about him. He had a friend who was at the Oracle of Delphi, and he asked the Oracle whether there was any man wiser than Socrates. To this, the Oracle replied, there is no man wiser than Socrates. This seemed preposterous to Socrates, but he could not argue with the God. How could he? A God cannot lie, it's not in their nature. And yet Socrates knew he was found wanting in wisdom. He knew he did not know much, and there were many others who seemed wise and had greater knowledge than he. So he developed a method of examination to discover a man wiser than he. He went to men who were said to be wise, not only by others, but more profoundly by themselves. He examined what they knew, and he found that they hid behind false wisdom and had no true knowledge themselves. He went to politicians, poets, artisans, and the wisest of all men he could find, and time after time he discovered that they professed to know something, when in reality they knew nothing. He was able to show blatantly that they knew nothing, and in doing this he made many great enemies, both from the people he was examining and from the people who were attending. They did not appreciate him making a fool of them, and worse than that, the youth of Athens took part what Socrates did. They would examine the wise men and prove their folly, and rather than being angry with themselves, these so-called wise men were angry with Socrates, and they hated him. Socrates knew that he was a fool, but who is more foolish, the fool who thinks himself wise, or the fool who knows himself to be a fool? For all men are fools, for only God is wisdom, and mortal men have not the divinity themselves for true wisdom. These phony men could not, however, find anything truly wrong with what Socrates was doing. Rather, they would lie and spread rumors about him, and declare, Socrates looks into the heavens and the earth, and makes the worse appear the better cause. In reality, Socrates never professed to know such things, and the present company was unable to conjure any instances where he acted as such. They also said that Socrates took money for his teaching. He then proved that he did not, for he was living in poverty and never had an abundance of wealth. He also proved that even if he did, it would not be a terrible thing, for like you would send foals to a farmer, you would send the youth to a teacher or a philosopher in his case. There were also many other teachers going around in Athens at that time, who did charge money for their teachings, but were not brought up in court. This is enough of a defense to satisfy Socrates as to the first class of his accusers, and he proceeds to the more recent. As to the new accusers, he knows them to be headed up by Miletus, who he then proceeds to examine. Miletus says that Socrates corrupts the youth of Athens, and does not believe in the gods of the state, but rather believes in his own divinities. Through the course of this examination, Socrates proves the folly of Miletus, and endeavors to show that Miletus is the evil rather than himself. He does this by showing that Miletus does no justice, and the evil that he is that he makes a joke of a serious matter, and is too ready at bringing other men to trial from the pretended zeal and interest about matters in which he really never had the smallest interest. During this examination of Miletus, Socrates proves that he does not corrupt the youth, contrary to what he is said to have done, but rather the youth come to him of their own accord, and he teaches them. He helps them discover the truth. Miletus says that Socrates intentionally corrupts the youth, but Socrates proceeds to prove that he cannot intentionally corrupt the youth. He, cannot, he can only not corrupt the youth, or must unintentionally corrupt the youth, but either way, he's an innocent man. Regarding to him not believing the city's deities and in creating deities of his own, he shows that these are nothing more than lies. He dedicated his life to Apollo, or the god of the Delphi, who gave him the oracle that shaped everything he did. However, Miletus claims that Socrates is a complete atheist, and he is a teacher of atheism to the youth. This was a contradiction to his previous statement declaring that Socrates created his own deities. Socrates points this out to the assembly and gives an end to discussing the new accusations. 
After he gave this address to the accusers and showed their folly, he addressed the court and told them that he would never change his ways, even if they offered him his freedom. He states, if you think it is necessary for a man to calculate the risks of living or dying, there is little use in doing that. Rather, he should only consider whether in doing anything he is doing things that are just or unjust, acting the part of a good man or a bad one. It did not matter to him whether he lived or died, for he knew that he did no wrong. He could accept death, and in his old age, it was inevitable. The court discussed and agreed to sentence him. Given the choice of the life in exile or death, he chose death, knowing life in exile would never suit him. He was sentenced to death by hemlock poison. And he ends with the following quote. But let me interrupt. You see, the hour of departure has already arrived. So now we all go our ways, I to die and you to live. And the question is, which one of us on either side is going towards something that is better? It is not clear, except to God. And that is the Apology of Socrates by Plato. Great. Uh, just a side note. Uh, when I do my quotations, I always use Benjamin Jowett. So if you want your quotes that you use from your paper to match with mine, Benjamin Jowett is a translator I always use. Okay. Yeah, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't. I'm just saying if you do. Because I'm going to be saying a lot of the same quotes that you just said. Yeah. And it just... It might uh, be a bit different. Yeah, it will be the same idea, just a different translator. So I always use Benjamin Jowett, just in case you're wondering why you see it one way when he says it and another way when I say it. Different translator. Uh, and then you're getting to the Yeah. Okay. Humans live their lives satisfying their needs and necessities. Toward the end of their life, they think about life after death. Is there an existence outside of the mortal realm? However, is there an afterlife? Socrates, in his last moments, addresses this question. He himself, or Socrates being a man, also thinks about life after death. In Phaedo, Plato writes about the way Socrates states his beliefs on the afterlife in his last hours. Socrates Socrates starts his argument in life after death with his premise that there is an existence after death. He then explains to the people there with him how he rejoices at the idea of death and is ready for it. He rationalizes that humans or creatures of the earth live and make judgments according to their senses. He then recognizes that these senses ultimately cloud our judgments on this earth and that we can never, as mortal humans driven by the pleasure of the earth, make a pure judgment of anything. Similarly, the senses and human pleasure cause, causes us to be impure, and as Socrates says, cannot live up to ideas such as knowledge of the good, true, and the beautiful. He then goes off the premise that all living creatures have a soul and rationalizes why we do. He continues with the argument further in saying that the soul is not clouded by the senses and is a pure thing. Furthermore, he gives a description about the soul and why this is the case. Humans are clouded by the senses and the pleasures of life, and the soul is pure and seeks wisdom and seeks wisdom of the good, true, and the beautiful. Socrates moves away from this part of the argument and speaks of opposites. He gives two examples of opposites. The first is the opposite of being asleep versus being awake. He explains that there is a process to get from one to the other. In the absence of sleep, we are awake. Similarly, in the absence of being awake, we are asleep. The second example is that of life is that of life and death. He states that in the absence of death, there is life, and in the absence of life, there is death. He then recognizes that there is a process to get from one to the other. When asleep, we have to wake up to then be awake, and when awake, we have to drift off to then be asleep. He uses this process of transferring from asleep to awake in his second example also. That is, we go through a process when alive to get to death. With this logic, he concludes that we, in death, have to go through a process to get to live. He then further co concludes that we were in an afterlife before this life and will be in this afterlife after death. In using this logic, Socrates explains that there is an afterlife and that we have been and will be in the afterlife. Socrates then asks some questions on whether the soul is immortal and imperishable, and gives logical analysis on why they are as such. 
When listening to this argument, he defines a philosopher to be a lover of wisdom and knowledge. He says that the soul is a philosopher in that he is a lover of wisdom and knowledge. Mortals, as they are clouded in misunderstanding due to the senses and pleasures of the earth, are not lovers of wisdom, but merely seek after that which gives them pleasure. The soul, being it, because it is immortal, does not have a want or need for such trivial things, but rather seeks after that which is true. He says to leave this life and move on to the next is to go through a purification process. That is when the soul has become, has been associated. That is when the soul has been associating itself with the body, it has clouded its pure judgments. In order to continue to a pure existence, one must split body from spirit and continue forth unto a pure and holy existence. He says that to do this one must learn, and to learn is to recollect the knowledge and wisdom that you have had when you were a soul before your mortal existence. In describing his thoughts on the afterlife and the soul, he rationalized how you shall receive rewards according to your deeds in this life. If you were a good and just man, then you shall receive good and just rewards, and if you were a cruel and evil man, then you shall receive cruel and evil rewards. Socrates in his last moments confidently takes a cup of hemlock and drinks. He then walks around for a bit until his legs start to fail him. He then lays on his back. When the poison starts to get close to his heart, he uncovers his face. His final words were, Crito, I owe a cock to Asclepius. Will you remember to get the debt paid? His body then goes stiff and cold. Uh, so, the sacrifice of the chicken there is... Uh, a common thing you would do if you were released from a disease, if you suddenly were cured of a disease. And so the reason that he's saying that is because he's about to be cured of this final disease, which he calls the body. The soul is going to be free from the body, and so he's now going to be cured and released. Now it's worth noting that of these dialogues, uh, the Phaedo is a Platonic dialogue. It's not a Socratic dialogue, meaning uh, this is one where Plato is using Socrates as a mouthpiece for expressing his own opinions. So we're now getting into uh, Platonic dialogues. Uh, because a lot of what comes up in that dialogue is not something that uh, we traditionally attribute to Socrates believing. So Socrates uh, definitely believed in an afterlife and that the only harm that could come to a soul is... Uh, committing a vic vicious action and the only thing that can improve a soul is committing a virtuous action and then you should cultivate virtue but uh, in in the Phaedo they also talk about a will of reincarnation much like the Pythagoreans did uh, that's uh, something that we attribute to Plato not Socrates and then uh, the arguments for the immortality of the soul there's four arguments given in the Phaedo for the immortality of the soul one of the arguments there is uh, the recollection of knowledge, and that's something that won't make sense to you until we get to play, though, so, well, that will come back and make sense, and we'll see when, when I actually bring that up, I'll connect, and this is how we get that argument for the immortality of the soul when we introduce that. Uh, there's something else I was going to say about it. The Phaedo. Hmm. I thought I was going to say something else. Maybe it will occur to me after we do the Apology. So, there's a brief run through of the Apology, and Phaedo will just be covering the Apology today because it's considered the most historically Socratic dialogue. You get as much Socrates as we can give Socrates. Uh, this is the only one where Plato specifically states that he was present at the event, the conversation, and obviously he's the one writing it. And we also have... Uh, a second source of a similar thing from another one of Socrates follows, so there's some way to reconcile the two to come up with a consistent view. So we'll do a deep back now into the Apology, this dialogue. And what's the scene of this dialogue? It's happening. The scene is at the trial of Socrates. It starts with Socrates giving his apology. It's understood that his accusers have just finished speaking. So you don't hear what his accuser said. It just starts with Socrates now addressing his accusers. So it starts with him giving his apology. Uh, and just like Jeremy said, uh, Socrates requests permission to speak in a manner which he is accustomed. He's never been in a courtroom before, and he's pretty much spends his days in the agora. That's like the, the marketplace where all the masses of Athens come together and do business, basically. So he says, allow me to speak like I did there, not, however, delivered after their manner, 
those who just came before him, those uh, rhetoricians and sophists who spoke right before him, the ones accusing him. So he's going to talk, not however delivered after their manner, in a set oration, dully ornamented with words and phrases. He's not going to dress up what he says. No, indeed, but I shall use the words and arguments which occur to me in the moment, for I am certain that this is right. So he didn't write his speech ahead of time. He didn't memorize it, twist it to get just that right emotional appeal to convince his judges to believe him. He's going to use what occurs to him right there in the moment. He's convinced of the justice of his cause, that he's right, and so he doesn't need to worry about manipulating his judges. Um, he requests that the judges only pay attention to what he says, not how he says it. Never mind the manner, which may or may not be good, but think only of the justice of my cause and give heed to that. Let the judge decide justly and the speaker speak truly. So, a little bit of how he thinks the court case should move forward, which obviously sounds great. So now he's got to start with his defense, now that he's explained that he's not going to speak the way that they might be accustomed to speaking. And he points out that he has two sets of accusers to deal with, those accusing him all his life, and then those currently present in the courtroom. Now, uh, remember that he is an old man now. He's uh, 71, I think, when this is happening. And the people that are accusing him, they're going to be in the prime of their political career. So they're going to be middle-aged men, and he's an old man. And so these people accusing him... Uh, are much younger than him. Now, Socrates has gone his whole life, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? He's gone his whole life growing this hatred of him. There's been stories about, he's, he's been cross-examining people his entire life, and so there's been this animosity against Socrates growing in Athens over an extended period of time, and people telling stories about Socrates, this terrible person, his entire life. So his judges now that he's talking to, because not just his accusers, but the judges, there's over 500 of them who are going to decide whether he's guilty or not. So he's talking to a bunch of judges. He's in a big room full of 500 people, and then there's all the spectators that are there as well. He's telling them, uh, I've got to deal with not only these guys, but you judges have already had your opinion of me tainted by people who are much older than my judges, people you grew up and looked up to your entire life who would tell false stories about me when you were a kid. And so you've been hearing false stories about me your entire life. So first I've got to try and address all those false stories so that you're not already biased against me. And then I'll come back and deal with the actual court case that you're actually listening to here. So he's got those two sets of accusers. Does that make sense? Yeah. So he's going to deal with the older accusers first. Since the judges have grown up listening to people who began when you were children and took possession of your minds with their falsehoods, telling you of one Socrates, a wise man who speculated about the heavens above and searched into the earth beneath and made the worse appear the better cause. So this is what he's been accused of doing for these judges their entire life growing up. And they've heard that this is what Socrates does. And this is a common, by the way, uh, attack brought against philosophers in general. Remember that prior to Socrates' trial here, we had... Parmenides, all the way back to Parmenides, driven out of Athens for this exact thing. So this has been a common thing that's happened in Athens a few times now. It's a common charge brought against philosophers. And so now the charge is being brought against him. And since the charge has been successful against past philosophers, a little kid growing up hearing this says, yep, he's just like those other people that have to be driven out. And so they make that association in their minds they're growing up. And now they're grown men listening to him, and he's got to try and hurry up and do away with that prejudice. Since the judges heard these accusations in their youth, the cause when heard went by default, for there was none to answer. Socrates couldn't defend himself when Papa told little Johnny that, hey, Socrates is a bad kid. Johnny just grew up thinking Socrates is a bad kid. Uh, since Socrates cannot argue against these accusers, he tries to sum up their position in affidavit. So he's going to try and sum up what uh, the judges have possibly grown up their whole life hearing about Socrates. Socrates is an evildoer and a curious person who searches into things under the earth and in the heaven and makes, and makes the worse appear the better cause, and he teaches the aforesaid doctrine to others. So that's kind of what he's been accused of doing his entire life. Now, uh, searching into uh, things under the earth and in the heaven and making the worse appear the better cause is something that's been uh, used against pre-Socratic philosophers who were natural philosophers, the physicoid, the physicist, the natural philosopher. So first thing Socrates points out is he has nothing to do with physical speculation. He is not a natural philosopher. He's not telling you how the universe works or any of that. He focused completely on ethics and how a man ought to live his life. 
So he's saying these charges you brought against these past natural philosophers, they just don't apply to me. It doesn't make sense. I've never speculated about those types of things. And he asks the people in the crowd, has anyone in the crowd, you've all heard me before, because a bunch of, a bunch of citizens that are friends of Socrates are coming and sitting here and listening to him. So basically everyone Socrates has had a major influence on is right there in that courtroom as well. Well, that's not true, but a good portion of them. So we ask those who have heard him his entire life, have any of you ever heard me give physical speculations? And they confirm, no, he has never given, he's never speculated about anything like that. So he's purely an ethical philosopher. He's not a natural philosopher. Uh, he also doesn't claim the same wisdom others do. He mentions, had I the same wisdom, I should have been very proud and conceited, but the truth is that I have no knowledge of the kind. So he's never claimed to have this great wisdom, and he has several people around him to confirm that. That's what he's always claimed, is that he doesn't have the great wisdom. So if Socrates isn't a natural philosopher, and he's never claimed to have this great wisdom, uh, why is Socrates so hated? He must be doing something that's creating all this animosity against him. So what's he been doing that's got everyone hating him? Now, Carafon, this is Socrates talking, Carafon, a friend of his, as you know, was a very impetuous in all his doings, and he went to Delphi and boldly asked the oracle to tell him whether there was anyone wiser than I was. And the Pythian prophetess answered that there was no man wiser. So now some bold guy goes to the oracle and says, is anyone wiser than my friend Socrates? Nope. Okay, so Socrates is the wisest. And naturally enough, careful on, tells people that this is the case, or gets back to Socrates, Socrates hears that this is the case. Now remember that the oracle often speaks in riddles. It's, you can't uh, apply some straightforward interpretation to what the oracle says. Uh, for example, you might remember clear back with uh, the Greece or Persian Wars, uh, when they asked the oracle about how how to protect Athens from the Persians, it was something along to the effect of, Athens will be saved by a wooden wall, not a stone wall, or something like that. You remember what it was? Just they'll be protected by a wooden wall. They'll be protected by a wooden wall. Now, the naive interpretation of that is, okay, so if Athens just built a wooden wall outside their stone wall, they'll be fine, right? And the interpretation that they apply later is, it was the wall of ships that protected Athens. So it's understood that when the Pythian Oracle gives you some oracle, there's some uh, deeper interpretation. You can't just take it at face value. So that's what Socrates is now looking for. He says, okay, right on the face of it, the oracle saying I'm the wisest, but that can't be what the oracle really means. There's a riddle to be uh, figured out here. We gotta solve the riddle. And so he feels like it's his job to solve this riddle. That Socrates is the wisest man. So what can the god mean, and what is the interpretation of this riddle? For I know that I have no wisdom, small or great. What can he mean when he says that I am the wisest of men? And yet this is a god and cannot lie. That would be against his nature. So, you just got to figure out the riddle. Socrates decides to seek out a man wiser than himself and bring him as a reputation to the god. So what's Socrates' big plan now? I'll go find a wise man who's wiser than me, bring it as a reputation, and then I'll figure out, I'll get to the bottom of this riddle. So it feels like he's on a quest assigned by the oracle to figure out this riddle. So that's what he's out to do. So in looking for the wise men, uh, he first goes to those with the greatest, uh, what would you just call it? Those who are considered wise in the community, naturally enough, the politicians. So first he goes to the politicians and seeks out one with a great reputation for wisdom. When I began to talk with him, I could not help thinking that he was not really wise, Although he was thought wise by many, and wiser still by himself. And I went and tried to explain to him that he thought himself wise, but was not really wise. And the consequence was that he hated me. So, Alan did something like this go. Socrates goes and talks to the politician about something the politician should know a lot about, like justice probably. He asks him for a definition of justice. The politician thinks he has a definition for justice. Socrates notices an inconsistency with it, tries to point that out to him. No, nope, you have a contradiction there. And the consequence is the politician hates him for pointing out the inconsistency in his view of justice, or whatever it was. So, Socrates' conclusion after conversations like this with the politician was, although I do not suppose that either of us knows anything really beautiful and good, I am better off than he is. For he knows nothing and thinks that he knows. I neither know nor think that I know. 
In this latter particular, then, I seem to have slightly the advantage of him. So neither of us are wise. I know that neither of us are wise. He thinks he's wise. So I seem to have a slight advantage on him. I will, am not wise and know that I'm not wise. He's not wise, but thinks that he is. So there he has a slight edge on him. So I guess if you had to call one of the two wise, which Socrates admits, okay, fine. In that sense, yes, I'm wiser than him. And this process repeats with many other politicians who seem to have a pretense to wisdom. So, and he starts uh, creating this animosity against him between all the politicians that he goes and examines in this way. So Socrates knows he is provoking hatred of himself. Why does he continue to go around questioning all these politicians? Socrates explains, but necessity was laid upon me. The word of God, I thought, ought to be considered first. And, and I said to myself, go I must to all who appear to know and find out the meaning of the oracle. So he knows that he's creating this hatred against himself, but he feels like God's called him on a mission, and he can't just ignore that. He should listen to the word of God rather than his fears of the hatred that he's uh, provoking against himself. So after examining the politicians, he then decides there isn't any wise politicians, maybe the poets. There's got to be wise poets. Remember that uh, poetry was held in very high regard in, at this time in ancient Athens. This is one of your two main forms of education. You have your poetic education and your physical education. So he decides he's going to go to the poets and examine them. Same conclusion. After the poets, he goes to the artisans. And with the artisans, he's a little bit impressed. The artisans, your craftsmen, stuff like that. Because there were some things that the artisans did know that he didn't know. Special things about like how to smelt certain ores together or how to build certain things. But he pointed out that the artisans were way too, they would generalize way too much with their specialty. So they got really specialized in this one craft and they thought somehow that gave them wisdom like this. We see this all the time. Someone becomes real specialized. I mean, how many times do we listen to medical experts now giving political advice, which is just absurd. They're experts here and they think that that somehow makes them experts here. And so in that sense, he's saying these artisans are overgeneralizing their knowledge. Yeah, they did know a lot that I didn't know in this area, but they keep trying to generalize it to this and it just doesn't work. So he again concludes he has slightly advantage of them. The result of my mission was just this. I found that the men most in repute were all but the most foolish, and that some inferior men were really wiser and better. So that's his great conclusion. Wisdom, those with the pretense to wisdom were the least likely to have the wisdom. Now, let him summarize what this led to. This investigation has led to my having many enemies of the worst and most dangerous kind, and has given occasion also to many cal calumnies, and I am called wise, for my hearers always imagine that I myself possess the wisdom which I find wanting in others. So, he points out that some politician doesn't really have a consistent definition of justice, and so his hearers assume oh, then Socrates must have a definition of justice. So he's saying that this is one of the reasons people think I'm wise. They think just because I point out you have a contradiction in your thinking that I must have it all figured out. And he's saying, but that's not the case. But the truth is, all men of Athens, that God only is wise. And in this, and in this oracle, he means to say that the wisdom of men is little or nothing. He is not speaking of Socrates. He is only using my name as an illustration. As if he said, he, O oh men, is the wisest who, like Socrates, knows that his wisdom is in truth worth nothing. And so I go my way, obedient to the God, and make inquisition into the wisdom of anyone, whether citizen or stranger, stranger just meaning they're not from Athens, who appears to be wise. And if he is not wise, then in vindication of the oracle, I show him that he is not wise. And this occupation quite absorbs me, and I am in utter poverty by reason of my devotion to the God. Any questions about that? So, that's one of his sums up. Now he, that's one of the reasons he's hated now. He's going to point out another reason that he's so hated. He explains that another reason he is hated is because young men of the richer class, uh, that seek, young men of the richer class seek him out and witness Socrates and imitate him. So, when so remember that uh, in, in these aristocratic families, these wealthier families, young men don't really have a lot to do. 
They don't have a lot of responsibilities on their time, so they would just be out in public places, out of the place to be, where Socrates would often also be. Also often be. <laughs> and so they would often hear him engage in these discourses with people, and they'd be impressed by what Socrates does. they say, oh, that's great. He showed that that guy wasn't as wise as I thought he was. Maybe I can mimic that same thing, that same Socratic style. So they go and start applying the same Socratic method to other people. So now we have not only Socrates going around, pointing out that people aren't as wise as they thought themselves were, but now all these clever young men who listen to him do it, they're out there doing it as well. So this enables youth to detect a pretense to wisdom in many, causing them again to hate Socrates. Because of some young guy who used to look up to you is now suddenly calling you out, you're not going to hate the young guy. You're going to hate the person that taught him to do that. Right? Yeah. So it's going back to Socrates. And so they have this hatred against Socrates, and they want to accuse him of something and get rid of Socrates. But since they have nothing to accuse Socrates of, they repeat the ready-made charge ready-made charges which are used against all philosophers about teaching things up in the clouds and under the earth and having no gods and making the worse appear the better cause, for they do not like to confess their pretense of knowledge has been detected, which is the truth. So, since they have nothing to say, they're going to come at me with the same things that they came at all past philosophers with. Nothing's changed. And so now we can understand why Socrates is currently being accused. So this is the two reasons why so many people in the past have hated him and why there's been all these stories circulating about Socrates. This is the reason why my three accusers, Miletus, Ananidas, and Lycon, have set upon me. Miletus, who has a quarrel with me on behalf of the poets, Anidas on behalf of the craftsmen, or the artisans, Lycon on behalf of the rhetoricians. So now that he's set the scene and tried to do away with the prejudice of his judges, now he's going to deal with his current court case and the people currently accusing him. So now Socrates is ready to address the affidavit of his current accusers, that Socrates is a doer of evil and a corrupter of youth, and that he does not believe in the gods of the state and has other new divinities of his own. Uh, so now he's going to deal with this affidavit from, this is the one that the judges just listened to. They just heard Miletus, Ananitis, and Icon argue this point. That's what happened right before this dialogue started. So now that's what Socrates is going to address. Socrates, to demonstrate that Miletus, Miletus is the one heading up the charge of the three, so Miletus is the one that he's picking on here. Socrates, to demonstrate that Miletus never gave much thought, has never given much thought to the improvement of youth, questions him and exposes him. How does he do this? He starts out with, you think a great deal about the improvement of youth. Miletus replies, yes, I do. And so Socrates asks him, Okay, so who improves the youth? Who is it that improves the youth? And he pushes Miletus to say, the judges improve the youth. But Socrates says, so just the judges, but what about these other spectators here? What about the assembly? Do they improve the youth? And Miletus has to say, oh yes, the assembly too. He doesn't want to offend anyone. And Socrates says, well, what about your fellow citizens out here? Do they improve the youth as well? Yep, yep, them too. And so Socrates says, okay, so every citizen in Athens improves the youth with the exception of me, and I am the only corrupter. Which Miletus is forced to say yes to. And then Socrates points out how contrary this is to all other arts and fields. When you have a horse, who can do good for the horse? Just the horse trainer. Everyone else who uses the horse only damages the horse and uses it towards some end. It's very few people that do the horse any good, and many that do the horse evil. And so Socrates points out that that's very contrary to nature, that there's everyone doing good with only one doing bad, and quite the reverse is typically the case. So he points out that Miletus probably hasn't really given much thought to who really improves and who really damages the use, and he's just trying to come after Socrates, which he makes it pretty obvious. Uh, he continues with Miletus, having some fun with him. Now Miletus accuses him of believing in different divinities, and then Socrates also gets Miletus to accuse him of being an atheist. So Miletus says that he believes in gods different from the state, and he's an atheist. Socrates points out how, how, how can he argue either of those? That's a contradiction. If he tries to argue against one, it already disproves the other. If he tries to argue against this one, it disproves the other. So he points out once again that the only way that Miletus could so, have such reckless charges against him is Miletus didn't really have anything to offer and was just trying to throw any accusation at him that he could think of. And he points out a few more things like that to show 
make it pretty obvious that Lee just didn't really give much thought to the charges he'd bring against Socrates. He just threw what he thought would stick. And so, I have said enough in answer to the charges of Miletus. Any elaborate defense is unnecessary, but the envy and deterioration, or so, sorry, detraction of the world will be his destruction. So, maybe uh, set that up a little bit better. Uh, he's explaining that he doesn't think that it's going to be Miletus and Nice and Lycon that kill him. So I've said enough in answer to the charge of Miletus, any elaborate defense is unnecessary, but the ambient detraction of the world will be my destruction, not these three, which has been the death of many good men and will probably be the death of many more. There is no danger of my being the last of them. So he thinks he's made it pretty obvious to the judges that these guys don't have a real case against me, but he also thinks that he's going to be sentenced to death here because of the hatred that's accumulated against him over time. And the law is that they have to decide the case in one day. They don't get dragged this out over many days. Socrates is pretty convinced that, you know, if we did this over several days, I think I'd convince all of you, but I have to, in a short time, do away with a lifetime of hatred, which next to impossible. So he doesn't think he's going to be able to pull it off. And that he's pretty sure he's going to die. So someone will say, are you not ashamed, Socrates, of a course of life which is likely to bring you to an untimely end? So he knows that even giving his defense and showing that there's no real attack against him, he's still going to die. Isn't he ashamed of the fact that he's led a life that's going to result this way? To him, I may fairly answer, there you are mistaken. A man who is good for anything ought not to calculate the chances of living or dying. He ought only to consider whether in doing anything he is doing right or wrong, acting the part of a good man or a bad. For wherever a man's place is, whether the place which he has chosen or that which he has been placed by a commander, there he ought to remain in the hour of danger. He should not think of death or anything but of disgrace. And this, O men of Athens, is a true saying. You ought to stay at your post and you ought to die at your post, if that's what's required. That's the right thing to do. So, he's going to stand at his post. Socrates points out how the state expected him to face death in the army many times. Remember, he fought in the Peloponnesian Wars. So he's saying, here I was in the Peloponnesian Wars, facing death like any other man. He was in three major battles. It's very likely that he could have died. How disgraceful would it have been if just because he was facing death, he was probably facing death, he abandoned his post. He says, no, such an act would be evil. Such an act would be disgraceful. I shouldn't do that, even when it's just a state telling me. Now, if I feel like God's called me to be at a post, and then I abandon the post, maybe you could accuse me of not really believing in God. But if I really believe in God, and I believe in the state, and I stayed and did what the state told me to do, what well, makes you think I'm not going to stay and do what God tells me to do? So that's what he's saying up here. So Socrates points out how the state expected him to face death in the army many times, and now if God orders me to fulfill the philosopher's mission, of searching into myself and other men, I were to desert my post through fear of death, then he might be justly accused of not believing in gods. Which he's not going to do. Now, what about letting Socrates off with a warning? So maybe he's moved his judges a little bit, and he's starting to get a sense that, I think that they'd let me go if I just promised that I wouldn't do this corrupting anymore, and I would just let philosophy alone. So, what about just letting Socrates off with a warning and don't show up here again. If you say to me, Socrates, this time we will not mind Anitus, and we will let you off, but upon one condition, that you are not to inquire and speculate in this way anymore, and that if you are caught doing this again, you shall die. If this was a condition on which you let me go, I should reply, men of Athens, I honor and love you, but I shall obey God rather than you. And while I have life and strength, I shall never cease from this practice of teaching philosophy. For this is the command of God, as I would have you know, and I believe that to this day no greater good has ever happened in the state than my service to the God. For I do nothing but what but I for I do nothing but go about persuading you all, old and young alike, not to take thought for your persons or your properties, but first and chiefly to care about the great the greatest improvement of the soul. So He's going to start turning this into an argument that they should let him live for their own sake. 
He's dedicated his life to their improvement. That's all he lives for. He feels like that's what God's called him to do, and that's what he's going to continue doing. Either acquit me or not, but whatever you do, know that I shall never alter my ways, not even if I have to die many times. So, when you told me to stay at my post, I stayed at my post. Now that God's called me to a post, I'm definitely going to stay at my post, regardless of what you tell me. And now he's warning him, it's, it's not me you're going to hurt by killing me. Killing me, that doesn't really hurt me. Death might not be that. We don't know if death is good or bad. We don't know. But if you kill me, you'll definitely be worse off. So if you kill me, you will not easily find another like me, who, if I may use such a ludicrous figure of speech, am a sort of gadfly, given to the state by the god. And the state is like a great and noble steed who is tardy in his motions, owing to his very size, and requires to be stirred into life. I am the gadfly which God has given this state, and all day long and in all places am always fastening upon you, arousing and persuading and reproaching you. And as you will not easily find another like me, I would advise you to spare me. I am nothing but an asset to the state. You kill me, it doesn't hurt me, it only hurts you. For your own sake, you should spare me. So I'm continuing to advise him. Like this man's whole life too. Now, if Socrates' only concern is the improvement of the state, why does he live a private as opposed to a public life? Why isn't he living a life like uh, Pericles lived, trying to work his way to the head of the state if he's trying to improve the state and lead the whole state towards a better life? Well, Socrates explains two times, we've already talked about these, but my good one. Socrates explains two times that he got mixed up in politics and how it almost cost him his life. The first time was the trial of the eight generals. You remember that trial? So the eight generals, they were going to be sentenced to death. So the way they were doing it, Socrates says that's not lawful. Everyone in Athens was really angry at the time, and so threatened Socrates' life. They ended up finding a loophole to do it, but Socrates opposed what everyone wanted. It almost cost him his life. He was lucky to get away with it. Uh, the second time is when the 30 tyrants came to power. So this is after Sparta wins the Peloponnesian Wars. 30 tyrants come to power in Athens. The 30 tyrants, to try and uh, include as many people in their crimes as they could, told Socrates to go do something illegal or they'll kill him. He refused and probably would have died again, but the tyrants were shortly overthrown. They didn't last long. So he points out that two times in my life I happened to get mixed up in politics for a short time, and both times it almost cost me my life, very easily could have. So he concluded that an honest man couldn't survive long in politics. So he's trying to do as much good for the state, but he thinks if he becomes a politician and stays an honest man, it's going to quickly cost him his life, and then he won't be able to do any good for the state. So he concludes that he do the most good privately, but that all were welcome to hear and speak with him, and that he charged nothing for his services. So he figured the best thing I could do is go put myself in a public place, like the Agora, where tons of people are, where anyone can make use of me, and I will try to make demonstrations publicly where everyone can see, and do as much good as I can in a private manner. So that's how he spends his whole life, trying to maximize his service to the state. He then points out that in all this, none of the people he is supposed to have corrupted, have corrupted have anything to accuse him of, and that they are all here rather to defend their corrupter. So one of the main charges brought against him is that he corrupted these youths, right? Well, now these youths that he's supposed to have corrupted are grown men. And now they can take their vengeance on him, since they were corrupted by him, right? And all these people that he's supposed to have corrupted are actually here to defend him. They're the ones that, in the Crito, try to break him out of prison. They're these people trying to preserve Socrates' life. So he says, all these supposed people I corrupted, now that they're older and have learned better, uh, they're all here to defend me, not to attack me. Isn't that a bit strange? Stockholm Syndrome lasting for a good 30 years. Lastly, Socrates asks the judges not to be angry with him for not bringing forth his wife and children to try and make an emotional appeal to win his acquittal or other tactics that the rhetoricians are in the habit of using. So he says, he points out some of you, so he's talking to a lot of people, remember, and a lot of you, when you were in the courtroom for probably less severe charges, you probably weren't looking at that, just a massive fine, you cried out in tears and you wallowed and you brought your wife and children and said, if you make me pay this, I won't be able to take care of them. And 
tried to really tug at the emotions of the judges, and now you're probably annoyed at me because here I am facing death, and I'm not doing what you did, and so you're probably a little annoyed that I'm not doing that. So he claimed that such actions are demeaning to the state and that judges ought not allow themselves to be moved by such displays. So he's going to continue instructing his judges about how they should judge <laughs> as he's facing death. And he says, in particularly, whether it's true or not, word has gotten out that Socrates is a wise man in Athens. Now, Athens already has a reputation for being the wisest city state in Greece, and now Socrates is considered a wise man. He says, think about how disgraceful it would be for the state if, whether it's true or not, people call Socrates a wise, they call me a wise man. So how disgraceful would it be for the state if I, supposedly a wise man in the wise city, cry out and make a great scene when I'm being put on trial and facing death? How ridiculous would that make the whole city look? Everyone would say, oh, the greatest in Athens are as bad as little children when they don't get something that they want. Athens must not really be that great. So he says, it's disgraceful not only to me, but to the whole city. We have a good reputation here. I'm not going to demean the city by committing this act. And at the same time, telling all of them to quit doing it. <laughs> so the last lines of his defense right here. And, and to you and to God, I commit my cause to be determined by you as is best for you and me. So that's the end of his defense. And the judges go and they deliberate, oh, what should we do? Big shocker, they find Socrates guilty. Now, the custom of the day is, you have all your judges, judges and jury are the same thing here, and there's like 500 something of them. So they all vote and they decide that he's guilty. So now the next stage that happens in the courtroom is, both the accuser and the defender propose a penalty. And then the judges vote on which penalty to accept. So the penalty isn't written into law like we have. Um, for murder, it's 25 to life in prison. Meaning, if you murder someone, you're found guilty. The least you can possibly get is 25 years in prison. So we have our sentences somehow codified, and the judge has some leeway, but it's also somewhat codified. Here, the accuser and defender offer up what they think the punishment should be for their actions. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's what the next part is dealing with. So Socrates is found guilty. Now they both have to propose what they think is the right penalty. Melissa and Socrates must both propose a punishment. Leaders proposes death. What does Socrates propose? He proposes maintenance in the Praetorium. Now, what is that? Praetanium. 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 There we go. The Praetanium. Uh, so we all know that the Olympics comes from Greece, right? Yeah. All the city states would get together in one city and they would have these athletic competitions. And it was a lot of prestige for the city if the city won the competitions. So Athens wanted citizens to win the competitions. Well, someone's not just going to dedicate their life to becoming the best runner in all of Greece just because you've got to give them a reason to do it. And so what Athens offered its citizens was maintenance of the fraternium, which is basically all your living expenses paid for for life. You come, you live in this great place, and everything's taken care of for you, and so you can live a life of luxury from here on out. So that's what Athens did. So Socrates says, here I am, I've dedicated my whole life to the improvement of the city. What do I deserve to have done to me in return? The city ought to take care of my maintenance for life, and let me continue spending all my time trying to improve you. That's what my punishment should be. <laughs> well, big surprise once again, the jury decides that they're not gonna reward Socrates, they're gonna punish him. And so they punish him with that. He also explains why he's not going to propose any other penalties. He says, why should I propose an evil when I haven't done anything wrong? And the worst that Miletus can come up with is death. And we don't even know if death, how do you know that death makes me any worse off than I already am? So death, he doesn't think that that's necessarily an evil. He's not going to propose something that's for sure an evil. And second off, he's not going to propose something negative anyways, because that would be an admission of some sort of guilt or the state somehow thinking that there's any guilt associated with it, he's not going to assign a penalty for him dedicating his life to the service of the state. So he gives a little bit of conversation about that. Anyways, the jury condemns Socrates to death. And so Socrates has some little bit of remarks for them. And now I depart, hence condemned by you, to suffer the penalty of death. 
and they, too, go their ways, condemned by the truth to suffer the penalty of villainy and wrong. And I must abide by my word, let them abide by theirs. I suppose that these things may be regarded as fated, and I think that they are well. So, he actually thinks that his dying is going to be a good in his life, and he says, I have to suffer death, let my judges, who found me guilty, suffer uh, the consequences of their action, the consequences of villainy and doing wrong. He also points out to him, probably should have put this one in here, he also points out to him, uh, you think that getting rid of me, you got rid of someone that's going to keep questioning you and pointing you out. He says, actually, there's been a lot of yous that I've been holding back who want to come at you. And now that you're killing me, they're going to come and accuse you. So you're not going to hide your evil doings by getting rid of the guy pointing it out. You're now going to have a lot more people pointing it out. So that's part of the evil, that the, the consequences of evil that they're going to have to suffer is people are going to continue to point it out. Now Socrates now addresses those who voted to acquit him. So those who voted for his death are going in, working out whatever arrangements that they have to work out. Those who voted to acquit him stay and talk with him for a little bit, while those who voted to kill him are making whatever arrangements to figure out what prison to start taking him to and other stuff like that. So he now addresses those who voted to acquit him. He tells them that the oracle made no sign of opposition. Uh, we should make some note of oracle because he uses oracle two ways. So sometimes he uses Oracle to talk about the Oracle at Delphi. The other times he uses the Oracle is when he's talking about his own voice of conscience, his own still small voice, this terminology we frequently use, his own voice of conscience in his head. So he has this voice of conscience in his head that often warns him against committing any sort of evil act. So that's what he means by the Oracle here. So the Oracle made no sign of opposition, either as I was leaving my house and going out in the morning, or when I was going up into the court, or while I was speaking, at anything which I was going to say. And yet, I have often been stopped in the middle of a speech, but now in nothing, either said or, or did touching this man. Or, yeah, sorry. Let me restart. But now in nothing, I either said or did touching this matter, has the oracle opposed me. This is a great proof to me of what I am saying, that, this, that his being sentenced is a good, not a bad. For the customary sign would surely have opposed me had I been going to an evil and not a good. So this oracle, this conscience, this voice in his head, has stopped him oftentimes even in the middle of a speech if he was going to say something that he shouldn't say. Or no, nope, don't say that. And it's oftentimes warned him against action, but he's saying even in this extreme case, here he was in the middle of a speech being cut off. And yet throughout this whole day, no at once did the oracle oppose him. So he's convinced that God's calling him home basically is one way to say it, that he's going to a good, not an evil, that he's not going to be harmed in death. And he's trying to comfort his judges a little bit because uh, they're not happy about the fact that an innocent man was just sentenced to death right there in Athens. So, trying to comfort them a little bit here. Wherefore, O judges, be of good cheer about death, and know that of a truth, that no evil can happen to a good man either in life or after death. The only evil that comes to a man is his own evil actions. If he's a good man and only does good actions, no evil can ever come to him. Uh, before he leaves them, he asks them for one more favor. When my sons are grown up, I would ask you, all my friends, to punish them. And I would have you trouble them, as I have troubled you, if they seem to care about riches or anything more than about virtue. Or if they pretend to be something when they are really nothing, then reprove them, as I have reproved you for not caring about that which they ought to care, and thinking that they are something when they are really nothing. And if you do this, I and my sons will have received justice at your hands. Because he's leaving some kids behind. I think only one of his sons is of age, the other two are underage, so he's worried about leaving his kids behind, wants them still instructed, so he's making one more request, make sure my kids are right. And then the very last line of the dialogue, when he finally has to leave, the hour of departure has arrived, and we go our ways, I to die, and you to live. Which is better? God only knows. And that's the end of the apology. Any questions about that? And you probably noticed a lot of the same quotes, but different terminology. So, 
I like that dialogue because it gives you a good sense of the character and conviction of Socrates, which is why I quoted him so much. When we get to Plato, I'll do a lot more just summarizing his philosophies and giving you actual quotes. And so, uh, gives you a good sense of Socrates and why, uh, why someone like him was able to kick off what's uh, we call it the golden age of philosophy. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, those three together, we call them the golden age of philosophy. And you can see, get a sense of Socrates' absolute conviction of objective and absolute good, objective and absolute truth, objective and absolute beauty, that man can come to understand these things and ought to spend his life in pursuit of these things. So he gets his student, Plato, who follows Socrates wholeheartedly and is also a genius and Plato then has Aristotle, who doesn't follow him wholeheartedly, but is an amazing teacher, and then an even greater student, and it just creates the golden age of Athens, so move on to those two. Unless we have any other questions about Socrates that we want to cover real quick, or anything you feel like I missed. Uh, well, can we go over the Crito? Uh, sure. So, the Apology, he leaves, now he's got to go to the prison cell. So, he goes to the prison cell, and... Uh, there's a uh, custom, don't know what it's called. There's a custom in Athens where a ship has to be sent to the island of Delos, is that what it's called? Annually. And it's a religious ritual, basically. And so there's a rule in, there's a law in Athens that no person is allowed to be executed during this festival, these, this religious holiday. So the ship has to be sent to the island of Delos and return in celebration of some past event. And no one in the state's allowed to die during that time. And the ship ends up getting delayed due to bad weather or storms or whatever. So this ends up being an extended period of time that he's in prison. I don't know what an extended period of time is, but much longer than your typical prisoner before they're put to death. So uh, During this time, his friends, his wealthy friends, work out a way for him to escape. So they find another city for him to live, a place for him to live, uh, people in the other city who will help get him there and take care of him when he's there and so they bribe the guards they come early in the morning they bribe the guards sneak into the prison come to get Socrates say look we made all the arrangements we got everything worked out we paid everyone off let's go and they didn't account for one thing <laughs> would Socrates go with them and so that's what Crito is they're trying to get him to go Socrates says that's all well and good and I'll go with you if you can convince me of one thing. Am I justified in going? And so, they have to convince him that he's actually justified in leaving the prison cell. It's not a matter of if he can leave the prison cell. It's a matter of if it's right or wrong for him to leave the prison cell. So that's what the conversation is about in the Crito. This conversation, are you just in disobeying the laws even if they were used against you unjustly? The analogy he uses somewhere along there is just because it seems like a father unjustly treats his son unjustly is the son now justified in striking the father here he is just an analogy but what he actually says is here i am in athens and i have willingly subject sub, subjugated myself to her and her laws i did that of my own free will and choice no one forced me to stay in athens when i came in age athens would have let me go to any city state i wanted i had my choice athens would have even let me take all my property with me no one forced me to stay here in Athens. It was my own choice. And now they came at me through the political process that I've subjected myself to. I could have left by staying. It's an, you're implicitly subjecting yourself. The fact that you live in America, you're implicitly saying, I agree to American laws. If you don't agree with American laws, you're welcome to leave the country. No one's going to stop you. But as long as you're here, you have to follow the laws. He chose to live in Athens. He's never left Athens. He thinks Athens is the greatest city on earth. So he's chosen to subject himself to Athens. And now Athens is felt found guilty and sentenced him to death. He says, am I now, because I don't like how things are turning out for me and feel like it's not fair, am I now justified in breaking the laws, which I've accepted this whole time? And his conclusion is, no, he's not justified in breaking the laws. And imagine trying to put together a political system where any time someone thought that the laws were no longer in their favor, they were justified in breaking the laws. The laws have no efficacy anymore. It completely destroys the political unit. So he's uh, completely loyal to the state, completely loyal to Athens. He's not going to do a wrong against Athens. He's not going to harm his mother's state. He 
He would be like, just like harming his mother, he doesn't think he's justified in it, and if his mother demands his life, so be it. He wasn't justified in abandoning his post there on the battlefield, why is he justified in abandoning his post now? He still harms the state, someone still subverted her laws. So, he refuses to undermine the state in any way, doesn't think he's justified in leaving. They can't convince him of that. They try to come up with their arguments, but as they come up with their arguments, he deals with them. And then the Phaedo, uh, a lot of the conversation in that is, it doesn't really have to do with Socrates, it just has to do with platonic dialogues, but it was to a large extent a historical event. Last day of his life, his friends came early. They were allowed to spend the entire day with him before he took the prison, or before he drank the hemlock and died. Uh, we even know what cell he most likely stayed in because the custom was before you drink the hemlock, you'd first go take a bath, so it wasn't hard for people who had to deal with your uh, burial process to make it easy for them. So clean yourself up right before you drink poison and then die, so you're already ready to just go through the burial process. So since there was only one cell that had a bathtub, they think they know the actual cell that he was in when he died. Uh, But, yeah, the majority of the conversation is giving positions on what they think life after death is like in the Phaedo. Uh, a lot of it is Socrates comforting his friends that uh, death isn't really an evil and they shouldn't have to be afraid of it. And he wants to spend his last hours philosophizing about what's going to come to death. He sends his wife away early on because she breaks out in tears saying, Oh, Socrates, this will be the last time you and your friends can philosophize together. So one of the first things he says in the dialogue is, cry, don't please have someone take her away. And later in the philosophy, or later in the dialogue, when his friends start breaking out in tears, he says, this is exactly why we sent away the woman, so that we wouldn't have to deal with this. Yeah. Now you're making me have to deal with this. Uh, right at the very end, the guard who gives him the hemlock to kill him, he feels terrible about it, and he breaks out in tears, and Socrates says, oh, how generous of him to shed tears for me. Because the guard, because Socrates was there for such an extended period of time, the guard that had to watch over him came to know him very well and was very aware of the fact that this is a man who should not be here and should not be sentenced to death. And he resents the fact that he's the one that has to prepare the poison and give to Socrates. He doesn't want to do that, but such is his lot in life. So Socrates drinks the hemlock and slowly dies, with his last words being... Uh, you need to sacrifice this cock on my behalf because I'm going to be released from my body. So that's the end of Socrates, and then Plato picks up where Socrates leaves off. Anything else about Socrates? Good? Okay, so maybe we can start on Plato. I just want to get through his uh, seventh letter, and then we'll continue from there. So after Socrates comes Plato, I should talk about that picture just a little bit. Plato's this one right here. So this famous painting called The School of Athens with a bunch of the great Greek intellectuals in there. Uh, at the center of it is Plato in Athens. Uh, it's very common for people to uh, create a narrative of all of Western civilization in terms of Plato versus Aristotle. And so these two are seen as opposed to each other. All of Western thought from here on out, you're either in this camp or you're in this camp, is a dichotomy that a lot of people like to create. So these two opposed to each other. The two great intellects, master and student, Plato and Aristotle, went over there. So first we'll be covering the one on the right, then we'll cover the one on the left, and then we'll understand why they are completely opposed to each other in their philosophies. So starting with Plato there. So, Plato, the greatest pupil of Socrates and the master of Aristotle. He's a great man in philosophy. He wrote over 35 dialogues, and he wrote 35 dialogues. We think there's argumentation about whether some of the dialogues are really his or other people's. And 13 letters. Now, in all this, he rarely ever wrote about himself. So, when it comes to his life story, we kind of have to piece it together from other people. Uh, in one of his letters, he says something to the effect of, uh, there will never be a dialogue with, there will never be a dialogue under the name Plato or something like that. His dialogues were to immortalize the name of his teacher, Socrates. That's what they were for, and so he wasn't going to 
write about himself in this dialogue. But fortunately, we also have 13 letters of his that were sent back and forth, which capture whatever events he was currently talking about. So from that, we're able to piece together a good amount of his life. And then obviously, he had just a tremendous influence on all of history from here on out. Uh, and so we can also get from his followers piece tidbits of his life. Now, probably what one of the things he's most founded for, famous for is he founded the academy, obviously the institution that this institution gets its name from. This is the first higher, uh, higher education institution in Western civilization. The first university, so to speak. First place where you go and you can formally now study what we call philosophy. So he starts the academy. Uh, this is going to be uh, more of a research institution than a, your typical college. You don't just go here and learn, you go here and study and push forward the body of knowledge that's known at the time. So all your greatest intellects are all going to be in this one place, gathered at the academy. And his followers were called, since they attended the academy, academics. And that's where we get our name, academics and academia. All comes from Plato's Academy. Why is it called the Academy? Because it was close to a gymnasium by that name. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, he's possibly the most influential philosopher of all time. Uh, if you were to ask a random philosopher uh, to name the three greatest philosophers of all time, chances are they would pick Plato, Aristotle, and Immanuel Kant. It's just a matter of what order they would put those in. So he'll always be in anyone's top three list. Some people will put him number one, other people won't. But definitely extremely influential, possibly, arguably, the most influential philosopher of all time. Uh, and his dialogues, since that's all we have of his philosophy, are therefore tremendously important, influential in all philosophy from here on out. To the point where, as the author says, ignorance of them, Plato's dialogues, is tantamount to ignorance of philosophy itself. If you don't know Plato's dialogues, you're not even educated in philosophy. Um, Whitehead, what's his first name? Worked with Bertrand Russell. Alfred? Alfred Whitehead? I think that's his name. He had a famous saying that all of philosophy is footnotes to Plato. Plato started it all. He's the first one to come up with a complete system of philosophy and everything else from there on out is working out the details of what he started. All of philosophy is footnotes to Plato. So. He's going to be the first one to start all of the branches of philosophy and come up with a coherent system. So first to create a complete system of philosophy. So he had a metaphysics, uh, epistem an epistemology, an ethics, a politics, and an aesthetics. He has positions on all of these. Furthermore, he has coherent position on all of these that tie together. We've seen people prior to him talk on a bunch of these different issues. He's the first one to jump into po politics in a major way. So that's different. But we've seen philosophers prior to him talk about separate fields of philosophy, but their two ways of talking about the fields are completely incoherent with each other. So if you go back to Parmenides, Parmenides had the way of truth and the way of opinion. The way of truth is this universe is a big ball of indifferentiated stuff, and nothing really happens. And then he also had his way of opinion where he's trying to be a natural philosopher and talk about the world as it seems to us. So he wanted to talk about the world as it seems to us, but the world doesn't really change in any way, and those two views aren't coherent with each other. You had the atomists, the atomists who would say, you're basically, you're just chemicals in motion. Choice is an illusion. But then they created an ethics where they tell you how you need to make better choices, completely incoherent with each other. They don't work. So while some people pick a couple of these to talk on, Plato is the first one to talk on all of them in a way that they're all integrated and tied together with each other. It's the first complete system of philosophy. All his views work together into one coherent view of philosophy. He's the first one to do that. So that's why he's so tremendously important, and later philosophers now are going to fail, with the exception of one school, are going to fail that they have to do the same thing. If we're going to have a coherent philosophy, we need to make sure that we answer all our metaphysical questions and make sure we answer them in a way that they're consistent with our epistemological questions and consistent with our ethics and our politics and our view of aesthetics. We need to have a coherent, complete view on all these things. So, he's the first one to do that, which is why he's so tremendously influ influential in uh, philosophy. Okay, while he had a system, a complete system of philosophy, he seems to have always been critical of it throughout his entire life. An example of that is his dialogue of the Parmenides, 
we'll get into his theory of forms in more detail, his theory of forms, but the Parmenides is one of his views where Socrates gets absolutely demolished by Parmenides. Now, it doesn't have much to do with Parmenides' actual philosophy. That's just who Socrates is talking to in the dialogue. And in the dialogue, Socrates presents Plato's positions, and then Parmenides rips it apart, showing out all the problems with it. And that was Plato being very critical of himself, showing that even though he has this complete integrated view of philosophy, uh, he knows that there were still things about that he didn't like and that weren't explained very well. Does that make sense? Yeah. But nonetheless, first to do it. So we won't jump into any of his philosophy tonight. We'll just try and hurry up and get through his life. And the next time we'll be ready to start with uh, his philosophy. Uh, do, I don't know if I'm done with his life. We'll just get through his letters and then come back here. So Plato, his real name is Aristocles. Plato was a nickname that he was given. Uh, they speculate by his wrestling coach. Uh, Plato just means broad. So uh, the theory is that he was a tall, tall, strong man with broad shoulders. So he's a big guy. Uh, that painting, by the way, is in no way historical. Should probably throw that in there. The man who painted that painting just picked people that he knew and painted them and just gave them names. This is now Plato, this is now Aristotle. So that wasn't based off of anything that they saw. That's in no way historical. Anyways, so Plato, just a nickname, real name, Aristocles, but everyone calls him Plato, so from here on out, we'll just call him Plato. Uh, he belonged to an aristocratic family, a very high up there aristocratic family. He was uh, related to the original kings of Athens on his father's side. So going way, 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 way back in time to when we're talking about the time of the Mycenaeans, Athens was a kingdom with kings. So on his father's side, he's supposed to be related to the kings of Athens. On his mother's side, he's supposed to be related to Solon, the lawgiver, one of the seven sages. He's a contemporary of Thales, who gave Athens their great laws that they followed from there on out that supposedly led to Athens' prosperity. Now, he's also related to Critias and Parmenides. These were prominent members of the 30 tyrants. After Athens lost against the Spartans, the 30 tyrants came to power. And so Plato, since he's part of these aristocratic families, and it's going to be higher up people who are chosen to be tyrants over the city, his relatives were those higher up people. So he is very well connected when it comes to the upper life of Athens. He's very politically connected. And these two were two uh, very prominent members, Critias in particular. Uh, I lost the French guy's name. French Revolution guy who killed tons of people and said they should all be executed and ended up getting executed himself. You know it starts with a J. <laughs> uh, ah, it's killing me. I could have told you one minute ago. Ah, he, he was re so, uh, often metaphor is that he's like that for Athens, the same way that that French dude was for France. Because during the French Revolution, uh, when they were trying to set up their, you know anything about French Revolution? Not much. About them trying to set up the communism, the people overthrowing their government. Well, one of the things they went crazy with is beheading everyone. Anyone who had any power, anyone who was in the higher tiers of life, they killed them as the people took power from the uh, government. So even the king was beheaded. Lots of people were beheaded. No, oh, I just had it. Son of a gun. <laughs> Anyways, the main... One of the main people leading the French Revolution, he went so crazy beheading people, eventually people said, ah, he's at a high position, he needs to be beheaded too, so it came back to fight him and he was beheaded. Well, Critias was similar. Once he came to power, he went a little bit crazy of uh, beheading his political opponents, not beheading them, but killing his political opponents or banishing his political opponents to try and hurry up and uh, not seize power, but that's where I'm looking for. Make his control stronger, huh? Say solidify. solidify, that's exactly the word I look for. Solidify his hold over Athens. 
So once these 30 tyrants come to power, they go crazy trying to solidify their hold on Athens. And uh, what, what's the expression? The tighter you grip it, the easier it is, the quicker it goes through your fingers, that type of thing. So they tried to quickly take out all their political opponents, and it was absolutely disgraceful what they did. So Plato was very much tied to these people. He knew them very well. When they came to power in Athens, then he was in a ideal position to step up into a political position. So he's in a position where he can obtain political power in Athens. So he was invited at a young age to take part in politics, but he ultimately refuses. And he left Athens and traveled extensively after the death of Socrates for 12 years, supposedly traveling all around Greece and into Egypt. But let's deal with uh, his take on Socrates. So in his seventh letter, he gives his position now. This is him writing a letter to some people in Syracuse, doesn't matter. But this is him writing a letter, him talking about the events that took place in Athens with Socrates dying and with the 30 tyrants coming to power and then the democracy, democracy coming to power right after that. So three quick slides uh, covering this same stuff. I just wanted to do it in the same class because we're going to be talking about Socrates again right at the beginning of Plato. So I want to get that done since we just finished Socrates. So Socrates talking about, or Plato talking about now, his own personal experience, what's happening in Athens during the rise of the 30 tyrants. In my youth, I went through the same experiences as many other men. I, sorry, I fancied that I should at once embark on a political career. And I found myself confronted with the following occurrences in the public affairs of my own city. The existing constitution being generally condemned, the existing constitution here is going to be the democracy. Now remember how unstable that democracy was at the end of the Peloponnesian Wars. They went one day, they killed their eight generals, the next day they're like, why did we do that? Now we have no one to lead our armies. They were very fickle. So it was kind of understood by everyone, it was accepted by everyone that there's a problem with this current constitution in place. So the existing constitution being generally condemned, a revolution took place. And 51 men came to the front as rulers of the revolutionary government, while 30 were appointed rulers with full powers over public affairs as a whole, which is why we call them the 30 tyrants. So there was 51 people in high political offices, 30 of them at the highest echelons, which we call the 30 tyrants. So that's who that is. Some of these were relatives and acquaintances of mine. And they, at once, invited me to share in their doings as something to which I had a claim. The effect on me was not surprising in the case of a young man, he's in his 20s when this is happening. I considered that they would, of course, so manage the state as to bring men out of a bad way of life into a good one. Athens has been a terrible place, now all my good friends and family are being appointed to these high powerful positions where they can pretty much do whatever they want. Athens is now on track for a golden age. That's a sinking here. So I watched them very closely to see what they would do. Now he's very disappointed with what they do. And seeing as I did, that in quite a short time, they made the former government seem by comparison something precious as gold, for among other things, they tried to send a friend of mine, the aged Socrates, whom I should scarcely scruple to describe as the most upright man of that day, with some other persons to carry off one of the citizens by forcing, by force to execution, Sorry, this is a long sentence, and I need to explain some of it as I go. So they tried to get Socrates to go and grab someone and assist in the execution of him. So that's what he's explaining. The 30 tyrants, with some other persons, three other people, to carry off one of the citizens by forced execution, to carry off some other political opponent and kill him. So 30 tyrants tell Socrates and three other men, go get this political opponent and kill him. And that's how they tried getting Socrates involved in their crimes. And that's what they would do to try and uh, legitimize their position, get other people in high positions to do obviously illegal things. In order that, whether he wished it or not, he might share in the guilt of their conduct. But he would not obey them, risking all consequences in preference to becoming a partner in their iniquitous deeds. Seeing all these things and others of the same kind on a considerable scale, I disapproved of their proceedings and withdrew from any connection with the abuse of the time. So that's how he felt about what his good friends were doing. Not long after that, a revolution terminated the power of the 30. The 30 tyrants only lasted like a year. 
and the form of government as it was, as it then was. And once more, though with more hesitation, I began to be moved by the desire to take part in public and political affairs. So the 30 tyrants were overthrown. He's like, okay, that one's gone. Maybe now's my chance to get into politics. I began to be moved by the desire to take part in public and political affairs. But once more, it happened that some of those in power brought my friend Socrates, whom I have mentioned, to trial before a court of law, laying a most iniquitous charge against him, and one most inappropriate in his case. For it was on a charge of impiety that some of them prosecuted and others condemned and executed the very man who would not participate in the, iniquity, in the iniquitous arrest of one of the friends of the party then in exile. So you had the democracy was in power, overthrown by the oligarchy, the democracy comes back to power. Now Socrates helped the democracy out by refusing to support the oligarchy. And yet when the democracy comes back to power, they still come after Socrates. At the time when they themselves were in exile and misfortune. So when the D Democratic Party was at its worst, Socrates was there for him, still making sure that the law was upheld. He opposed the 30 tyrants, and the second that they get power, they're now back taking Socrates' life. So two times that Plato was, uh, we'll continue his life later from there, seeing how he's about to die. But, so you already see, two times that Plato was very tempted to get mixed up in politics, and both times he just thought, this is absolutely grotesque. He's going to get mixed up in politics a couple more times in the city of Sicily. Ultimately, he's going to be pretty turned off by politics in general. And, but the problem of politics is going to stay very heavily focused on his mind. It's going to weigh on him very heavily. And so he's the first, main, he's the first philosopher to write extensively on politics. And it's these events in a large way that push him that direction that, hey, we need a good system of politics. Because it seems like every time he gets some high hope, some expectation for some good to come out of a political system, it just is always worse than he expects. The 30 tyrants come to power, they're even worse than the democracy was before, before them, and the democracy, so the democracy's in power, they lose the Peloponnesian Wars because they're just a terrible government. Then the 30 tyrants come and they're even worse. But then the democracy comes and they come back even worse than they were before. So he's just becoming absolutely discouraged by politics in general. And we'll also notice a common theme with, theme with Plato as we continue, is a sense of degrade, uh, political systems degrade with time, and you can start to see why he's also going to think that a bit. Every new political system seems like it's a little, bit wor a little bit worse than the previous one, and so politics on the whole is in a decline. So this gives, hopefully gives you a sense of his fascination with the political problem, how should states be run, and uh, why these states keep on failing, You'll remember how a huge part of the republic is focused to that exact thing. How do we create a just state, an actual good state, a good system of government? So that's one of his major focuses. Anyways, so that's a little bit of introduction to him. Wanted to just cover this to get the Socrates part of him. Uh, any other questions before next week? Good? Okay. So we'll call it there. We'll do Plato next week.